there's always going to be competitors to any solution that you build. So the question is, is the market for them really mature or is it more obscure or people using more hacky solutions to solve the problem that your software is trying to solve? If you can carve out a, a little pocket of the market that's dissatisfied with the more generally positioned tools, you can really tap into a potentially large market where there's opportunity to expand beyond that. Hello and welcome back to Indie Bytes, the podcast where I bring you stories from founders in 15 minutes or less. In this episode, we have Derek Reimer, who is the founder of Savvy Cow, a new approach to calendar scheduling and has grown to thousands of MRR since he launched it earlier in 2020. Derek also co-founded Drip with Rob Walling in 2012, which was acquired by League Pages in 2016. You might have heard Derek on the Art of Product podcast with Tuple co-founder Ben Ornstein, where they document their journey building their products. As Derek knows with his SaaS product, it can be a huge challenge to keep churn down when you see traction which is why I've partnered with Chernkey for this episode. The founders of Chernkey know exactly how much of a challenge this can be, having collectively grown three SaaS companies to over 4 million in ARR. They realized that they were thinking about cancellations all wrong. A relationship with your customer doesn't stop with the cancel button, so they built Chernkey, which reduces churn by up to 42% with custom cancellation flows. For every customer that clicks cancel, Chernkey offers up dynamic offers that encourage customers to stay subscribed. Just connect Stripe and plug in a small bit of code. In minutes, you'll be reducing churn, immediately unlocking subscription pauses, dynamic offers, and cancellation insights. Visit churnkey.co to start your free trial. Also, if you didn't know already, you can sign up for the Indie Feast membership to get ad-free and extended episodes for just £4 a month at indiebytes.co forward slash membership. Let's get into this episode. Derek, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. So how's Savvy Cow going? Are you still sharing numbers with it or... Are you starting to rein that back in yet? Yeah, I can broadly share that like we're still still before default alive status, so not quite profitable in paying my expenses and, and salary, but we're marching towards that and should be there within the next couple of months. So that kind of gives folks a gauge for like where we're at. Good to see, good to hear. Can you tell me a little bit more in Indie Bytes listeners about Savvy Cow and what is it and what problem it sets out to solve? So the genesis for the product really came from having used scheduling tools for a number of years and and I initially felt pain with this because there's always a bit of anxiety sharing a scheduling link for me because I'm so mm. conscious of like maker time on my calendar and and not wanting to completely wreck my week or or even too many days in a week with calls sprinkled throughout interfering my ability to to get go deep on something. So I was first intrigued by this problem and then really unlocked an even bigger problem I think that's more widespread which is just overall like hesitancy to to share scheduling links because they can be seen as are like you're pushing mm-hmm. work onto someone else's plate so there's this weird power dynamic problem and so really started to dig into that and came up with a kind of a number of differentiators that set savvy cal apart from other tools we put the calendar front and center so that when you're looking at your own calendar you can see all your events and you can quickly change things on the fly if you want to block off a piece of time or just tweak something specifically for the person receiving it and then on the receiving end they also see a calendar view with your kind of open blocks of availability and they can overlay their calendar so they don't have to click back and forth so we're just trying to make it like as hyper convenient as possible for both parties and basically help guide people towards using a little bit better etiquette and just making this hopefully so that people don't just fall back to the the less efficient option of like ping-ponging times back and forth it's kind of the goal and i've been a savvy cow user since relatively early on because (laughs) i've tried a bunch of different scheduling links and i always felt that sort of to be that faux pas of sending a link and putting work on someone else But what you've gone into is a super, super competitive, crowded market. You've got the big one, which is Calendly, which so many people use. What made you go into such a competitive market where the problem might have been already solved? Yeah, I think this is like something that a lot of founders have to weigh. Do you pick something that is more niche where there's less activity among competitors? Like there's always going to be competitors to any solution that you build. So the question is, is the market for them really mature? Have they been around a long time? Or is it more obscure or people using more hacky solutions to solve the problem that your software is trying to solve? And in this case, I think there's a case to be made for just going after these bigger markets as an indie hacker, because I think... Different dynamics open up opportunities for a new player to, to come in and get some market share. Like in, in this case, there, there are a lot of competitors. There's a lot of different niches to, to potentially speak directly to. And I think a lot of the tools are really broadly positioned. And that's an opportunity. Like Calendly is just like 
super broad, targeting anyone who's scheduling any kind of meeting. And so one of the one of the standard playbooks for, for getting off the ground is to zero in on something more specific, something that people really care about. And so that's an approach that I took to heart with this and also recognize that if you can carve out like a, a little pocket of the market that's dissatisfied with the more generally positioned tools, you can really tap into a potentially large market where there's opportunity to expand beyond that, which is, I think, what I'm seeing with Savvy Cal. And there are a bunch of other dynamics, too, about the product that were really interesting to me. Another kind of property of it is that there's a, a viral component to it where anytime yeah. someone uses a link, they're spreading the word about the tool to the person who's receiving it. And and that's something that's really interesting to think about capitalizing on. There are a bunch of other properties too. Like it was pr relatively quick to get the initial version out. And so that that was one of my own criteria. Like I didn't want to do a nine month build out on something. I wanted to be able to get it <laughs> into market quickly. And, and so all these things combined, like sent me down this direction. But I think there's something to be said for kind of not being afraid to uh, to compete, especially in a market where there's a fair number of incumbents and they've been a little bit stagnant for a while. So I think mm -hmm. Calendly has been around for years now. The product hasn't evolved all that much. But when you are large and successful and you've been around a while, things tend to calcify a little bit. You lose the ability to move quickly because people come to expect certain things in your product and to change that is to potentially upset hundreds of thousands of people who are used to the the status quo and so that's also something that's interesting to think about you can be really nimble when you're new getting a fresh take on the problem it's a huge benefit for indie hackers and solo founders or small teams how quickly they can ship things and put new features out there they can listen to customer requests and uh, decide if they're going to build that feature and they can when you've got an yeah. incumbent there's a lot of process there's a lot of bureaucracy in some cases H how long were you building savvy cal for before you launched and got those first few users yeah so i started working on the product like validating it around the beginning of of the pandemic actually so about a year ago and it just so happened to to be a tool that became increasingly in demand as more and more people moved towards remote working and needing to be more deliberate about scheduling things on a calendar as opposed to just seeing each other and passing in the office. So I think that, that timing just happened to work out pretty well. But I started on it then I spent probably a month and a half like having conversations with, with potential customers and zeroing in on what the initial feature set should look like for this. And then spent a couple months building, started inviting the first few users to start testing the product out in mid-summer. And then, and then I launched it to the list in September and then did product mm -hmm. hunt in January. Yeah. How much of your growth do you reckon has come from the, your sort of pre-existing audience, maybe people following you from project to project, people following you on Twitter, newsletter, and then did you, was there an inflection point when you're like, actually these, I'm starting to get users who um, haven't been following me and they're, they're more traditional users of a product? I, I would say definitely a lot of the podcasts and Twitter audiences served as, I like to think of it as kindling for the fire. It's mm -hmm. like they exceeded the initial awareness and growth. But I, I think really Product Hunt launch, it, it worked out really well for me and it doesn't work out well for everybody. So it's it's like hard to... It's hard to say that this is like a go-to strategy that others can necessarily replicate because you never really know what's going to happen when you put it on a kind of a popularity contest sort of site like <laughs> that. But there are definitely things you can do to set yourself up for as much success as possible on, on Product Hunt. But that, I think the product, just by nature of what it is, it's pretty broadly appealing. And I think it had a really good fit with the type of audience that, that spends time on Product Hunt that really set us on a different trajectory and opened us up to a newer newer markets that hadn't been following me already so we got like several thousand registrations user registrations off of that touching on that product hunt launch what steps did you have to do to get to a couple of thousand people signing up <clears throat> what goes into a good product hunt launch and do you think founders rely on that launch too much i think that yeah i mean it's not something you can ever rely on and that's the i think the mistake is expecting that to be the end all be all but i think yeah, some things that we did to make it to make it successful. We put together some some emails to send out to the existing list, existing customers to let them know in advance. And then we of course made sure to post it right around midnight Pacific time because that's when the day rolls over. So you want to give yourself as much time as possible throughout the day to accumulate upvotes. Emails a couple days in advance and then of course an email that goes out right after the, the listing goes live, letting people know, hey, we're live. We did ask for Heaton Shaw to post it for us and he graciously said yes. And that can be helpful. The initial upvotes and and comments came from people who were following the journey or using the product. 
and it product hunt is just all about keeping the momentum wave going so being very yeah. active i was making sure to respond to every commenter for the, at least the first few hours tweeting about it throughout the day changing links on social to everything pointing to the product hunt post and just doing everything you can to drive people there yeah you mentioned we you've been working with Corey haynes who's on episode six or seven of indie bites yep. for help with marketing and growth and it's been cool to see the impact he's had. Should more founders bring marketing people on board and at what sort of stage they bring them on in terms of MRR? Yeah, I think the challenge that a lot of indie hackers may have is is budget. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason why I was able to do that is because I raised some capital through Tiny Seed, and so I have some money in the bank that I can deploy towards or invest in, in paying somebody like a Corey. I was initially hesitant i wasn't sure because we started working together in november and i just had a couple thousand dollars in mrr at that point i think so i was like not sure how long the road was going to be to even being able to pay myself or replace my own salary basically for for a lot of people just starting out like a really good combination that you see is like co-founders one being a more technical person the other person being more on the the marketing and business side that's a really dynamic combo that's hard to beat obviously it's difficult to find too if you're if mm -hmm. you can't just snap your fingers and find a co-founder but i've seen that kind of model work out a lot if you don't have the budget to, to to hire somebody what sort of things have you done with Corey? what what the standout things you've done from bringing him on to now we kind of have this dynamic where we will just bring ideas to the table and, and brainstorms we have this dot going that's just like any outlandish marketing idea you can think of like things that a lot of things that don't end up getting done, but we just throw them in there. What's good about our dynamic is that some people are just like marketing consultants who aren't necessarily willing to to do execution work. And at this early stage, like it's really important to have hands on deck that can actually plan, strategize, and execute because otherwise I'm the bottleneck and I probably honestly wouldn't do as good a job as he's doing on execution on this, this stuff too. But you really need to have kind of people who are willing to wear multiple hats and get their hands dirty, which Corey's been able to do. Um, and you, you mentioned you were able to bring on Corey because of the Tiny Seed funding. Can you explain quickly to me what the Tiny Seed funding is? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, actually. I mean, basically, Tiny Seed buys a chunk of equity in your company, and their standard terms are like 12%, $120,000. So it's basically a million dollar valuation that they buy come in at. And I think those terms vary depending on how many founders you have, and they may have changed a little bit in their current, current batches, but that's what it was when I came in. So yeah, it, and they just own equity. And there's no kind of complicated accelerated payback or anything like that. It's just they're in it for the long haul with you. And when you take dividends out of the company, they receive proportional dividends. And if there's a sale, they get to participate in that. So uh, do you think you would have raised the tiny seed funding without no Rob, your co-founder at Trip? I don't know. It's, it's hard to separate like the being a known quantity. Would, have I, would I have been accepted? It's hard <laughs> to say because I, <laughs> yeah. if I hadn't been part of Drip or hadn't been like hadn't been doing what I've been doing the last 10 years, who's to say? I don't know. Yeah, more in terms of if other founders came across the opportunity or, or they're, they're looking to grow in a certain way, should they look into Tiny Seed and has it been worth it for you? Yeah, I definitely think so. So there, it is a pretty competitive program. I think to get thousands of applicants and they just announced they raised their $25 million fund and they're planning to to accelerate how many companies they invest in too, which is really exciting. But generally they are looking for early stage companies with signs of early traction. So if you have between like that five to 10 K MRR, like you got something going, it's off the ground. There's a proven model, but maybe you need help growing it. You need help advice, mentorship on how to take it to the next level. That's really their sweet spot where they fit in. I'm we'll round off talking about one of my favorite podcasts ever. I've been listening to our product for two or three years we've seen other podcasters do this similar two bootstrappers talking about building them can you think of any others with, that were doing it when you started it yeah i think bootstrapped web is one of the with jordan uh -huh. and brian castle they're, they're the ones we credit with taking the model of just two founders getting on the mic talking about they're working on so they were there they were doing that we've had this standing call then my co-host <laughs> said like any everybody should be doing this which and there are a lot of benefits to it you get exposure just by people following along there's a certain amount of public accountability that comes into it you know like every week I'm in the back of my mind thinking about oh, what am i going to talk about on the podcast i got to do something interesting this week so it's a good 
It's a good forcing function. These are the podcasts I enjoy the most following along. I feel like even if I don't really know the the hosts, you feel like you know them just by listening to their journey. And how, how much do you talk with Ben off air? Most of our conversations are on air, actually. And we try to intentionally try to keep it that way. So we save the best for on air. Occasionally text back and forth or debrief after the show about stuff that we can't really talk about publicly. But yeah, save mm -hmm. most of the good content for, uh, for the mic. Cool. All right. Derek, thank you so much for joining me. We finish on three recommendations, a book people should read, a podcast people should listen to, and an indie hacker or entrepreneur people should follow. Book, I would say The Mom Test by <laughs> Rob Fitzpatrick. Super actionable book. It's not like your typical business book that is fluffy. Let's see, podcasts. I've been enjoying Software Social podcast. It's a, a, newer, a newer entrant into the kind of bootstrapper podcast but with Michelle and Colleen, Michelle being a little bit further along in her journey and Colleen just starting out. And it's fun to hear female voices in the space. Fair well. enough. Well, great recommendations, Derek. Thank you so much for joining. I'll leave links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. I appreciate you joining me. Thanks for having me.